Hi, church. I'm glad you're here. Welcome. I'm glad you're here if you're online with us. We welcome you, uh, whether you're watching right now or later today or later in the week, we acknowledge you. We want you to know you're a part of us, and even though you're not physically here, you're here, and we're with you, and we love you, and pray that God blesses you wherever you are right now. So you at home and you here, take your Bibles and go to Romans 14 if you will. Uh, like Jonathan said in that uh, video, I'm, I'm going to be finishing this short little series in Romans 14. And when you get there, uh, put a finger in Romans 14 or a piece of paper and then go to Luke chapter 11. I'm going to go right back to Romans 14, but I want to read a portion of the Gospel of Luke before I get there. I'm going to begin reading in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 14. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let all who have ears hear. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute, and when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges." But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now Romans chapter 14, and I'm just going to read the one verse there, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God for this word. They brought a man who couldn't speak, a man that was mute to Jesus, and he immediately perceived that the reason the man could not speak was because of a demon. There was a demon who was inside this man oppressing him in such a way that it stopped him from being able to speak. And Jesus cast that demon out of him and immediately the man's tongue was loosed and he was able to then speak, and the Bible tells us that the crowds that were there were separate in that the one group marveled that this happened. They were astounded that this took place. And the other group proclaimed that he did cast this demon out, that's obvious, but he's empowered by Satan himself. Satan is the power that's in him that caused him to cast out a demon, and Jesus exposes their silly and faulty logic by saying to them, how can you say that I'm empowered by Satan to cast out demons? Don't you know that a, a kingdom divided against itself will never stand? Why would Satan cast out his demons from someone that he told them to possess? Why would Satan divide his kingdom that way? That's not what happened at all. Then Jesus makes this really <clears throat> different kind of statement when he says, but if I cast out this demon by the finger of God, then know this, the kingdom of God is here. That's an amazing statement. Your, your finger is not the strongest part of you, you know. And Jesus says, if what I just did was cast out this demon by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is here. They may very well, especially the Pharisees that were there, they may very well have recognized that phrase because it's used a few different times in the Bible. 
the finger of God. The first time back in Acts chapter 8, let me remind you that way back then is where God chose Israel to be his people, and when he chose them, they were in Egyptian bondage. They were slaves, and God raised up Moses and Aaron to go and confront Pharaoh and say, let them go, they're my people, let them go, they might come out and be my people and worship. Pharaoh hardened hardened his heart, and so God sent plagues, all kinds of different, ten different kinds of plagues to try to get him to relent and let his people go. The first time he told Aaron, uh, take your staff and go to the, the Nile River and slap that river and watch, and he did, and it turned to blood, and he looked to Pharaoh as if to say, you going to let him go now? And Pharaoh had these magicians around him. It's a weird thing. Don't know exactly what all that meant. But he looked at them and gave them a nod. And one of the magicians went over to another waterway and he slapped it with his staff and it turned to blood. And Pharaoh looked at Aaron and said, then God told Aaron, I want you to take your staff and this time I want you to go hit the Nile River again and watch what happens. And he hits the Nile River and frogs come out of the river and cover the entire land, go into the homes, go into the houses. My wife's worst nightmare come true. She'd have done anything God said at that point, I guarantee it. All those frogs came in. Pharaoh gave the nod to one of his magicians who went over with his staff and slapped the water and frogs came out. And Pharaoh looked back at Aaron and said, God said, next one, I want you to take your staff, Aaron, and slap the ground with it, hit the dust of the earth, and he did. And when he did, gnats came out of the ground, and the scriptures tell us covered all of the ground and covered all of the beasts and all of the animals and all of the people and all of the homes, and Pharaoh gave the nod to one of his magicians who then took his staff and slapped the ground and nothing. And he slapped the ground again and nothing. And the magician looked up at Pharaoh and said, this has been done by the finger of God. Power. Authority. Dominion. Rule. Come forward a little bit in Israel's history to that time where God beckoned Moses to ascend Mount Sinai and to meet him there because God was about to establish the covenant that he was going to make with his people and he was going to inscribe uh, the law on stone tablets and he was going to give them the law and stipulations and principles and all the things they needed to do and obey and accomplish if they were going to be in a right stead with him. This was the covenant. And the Bible tells us that when Moses went up there, God did indeed inscribe the law on stones of tablets but not with an etching uh, stone and not with a quill, but rather God wrote the law that his people would have to live by with, the Bible tells us, his finger. I'll give you one more. You remember an evil king in the Old Testament named Belshazzar? Anybody remember Belshazzar? He was the son of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and this was not a good dude. This was an evil idolater, and we read in Daniel 5, one time he threw a great big party, and present were all of his wives, and present were all of his concubines, all of his mates, all of his leadership were there, and they were drinking, and in the middle of drinking, as he started to get drunk, he sent some of his people and told them, go to the temple of God in Jerusalem and steal out all of their vessels of gold and silver and bring them back to me. The temple of God. Sacrilegious. But they did it. They went. They stole all of these vessels of gold and silver out of the temple of God that God had given instructions to his people to have in there and they brought them back to Belshazzar and he filled them with wine and booze and strong drink and kept drinking and and just desecrated the vessels that were in the temple of God. And as he was drinking out of these vessels, we're told in Daniel 5 that a disembodied hand appeared behind him. (laughs) That'll get your attention. And a finger extended and wrote on the plaster wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Perrin. No one could figure out what it meant. Finally, Belshazzar called Daniel in, and Daniel said, I know what it means. What it means is, Belshazzar, your time is up. For you have been put in the balance and found wanting, and your kingdom now will be divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Power. 
authority, dominion, rule. Every time we read about the finger of God, it is an expression of his kingship, of his power, his dominion, his rule, his reign. This is why when Jesus cast out this demon and they kept saying, it's from the devil, Satan made him do this. And he said, if it's by the finger of God that I did this, the rule, the dominion, the power of God that I did this, then you need to know this, the kingdom of God is here. Because that's what the kingdom of God is. It is that realm, that place, that, that sphere where God's rule is recognized, his reign is recognized, where God is king. And if he's king and ruler of your heart, then you're in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom is not here now to where we can see it or be a part of it physically. There's no land. Jesus even said, you can't look for the kingdom of God and say, there it is, here it is. You can't open your GPS and punch in kingdom of God. You're not going to find it anywhere. One day it'll be like that, by the way. One day the Bible tells us the kingdom of God will come to the kingdom of the world and we'll live in what's called the new heaven and the new earth where the entire globe, the entire orb we're on right now will be the kingdom of God and for all eternity we'll live with God and each other. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But right now you can't see it, but it doesn't mean it's not here. The kingdom of God is made up of the citizens of heaven, the citizens of God, the adopted children of God who are in his reign and in his rule. And Paul in Romans 14 all of a sudden brings up the kingdom of God that seemingly is out of context. We've been spending time in Romans 14 because there was an issue going on in Rome in that day, in the Roman church, that it's obvious that we see going on in our day, not just in the church but in the world, but unfortunately we see it some in the church too. Pardon me. What was going on in the Roman church in that day, around A.D. 56, by the way, what was going on is there were some people in there that were bickering and fighting and quarreling and judging each other and Paul exposes them and even says, you even are getting to the point where you're despising each other. You're not liking each other. You're hating each other. And the issue was they were quarreling over non-issues, non-essential issues. What was causing the division and the arguments were food, what you can eat and not eat. One side said only vegetables. The other side, you can eat meat and also drink. Can you have a glass of wine every now and then? And there must be special days. That day's more special than the other. And the other side, no, all days are alike before God these days. We've been released from Jewish tradition. We don't follow those things anymore. And they were arguing over these things. They were debating over these things, but there wasn't just a, a healthy debate they were carrying out to where they despised each other and were judging each other and trying to demean each other and trying to get them to see each other's side. And Paul writes them, and if I was to summarize what he says in Romans 14, what he says is, just stop it. Stop it. To this group, he says, you are right, by the way. You can eat whatever you want. There's nothing about days. Have a good glass of Merlot every now and then. You're right. They're wrong. But that doesn't matter. When it comes to these non-essential issues, it doesn't matter. Stop trying to convince them and stop trying to get them to join you for a big steak dinner. You'll have them violate their conscience. And even though it's not a sin to have that big steak dinner, they believe it's a sin. So if they eat that big steak dinner, then it's a sin to them. What are you doing? Stop it, stop it, stop it. And then right in the middle of all this, he says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. In other words, in the realm of the authority and power and dominion of God, there is no debate about what you can eat or not eat or drink or not drink or about Thursday or Tuesday. That's not, that's not a value in the kingdom of God. That's not what we're about in the kingdom of God. And then he tells them what the substance of the kingdom of God is when he says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There you go. What, what he's saying is, you're in the kingdom of God. And you're debating whether or not you have to be a vegetarian? Come on, guys. You're in the kingdom of God and you're debating whether or not you can have a glass of wine? Come on. 
the sum and substance of the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, what does he mean by those three words, those three characteristics of the kingdom of God? What's he mean? Because that is really important, and if we see it, then we'll understand why Paul inserted or brought in the kingdom of God in the middle of this discussion about arguing over non-essentials. So let's think about righteousness for a minute. Does he mean by righteousness me living right, me being ethical, moral, upright? He doesn't in this context. And the reason I know that or strongly believe that, and by the way, living moral, upright, ethical life is really important in the kingdom of God. It's just here when you look at how Paul uses the word righteousness all through the book of Romans, he writes about it 34 different times in the book of Romans. And although there's two or three places where he uses that in the context of living an upright, godly life, the utter overwhelming majority of them is when he's talking about, listen, the righteousness of God that's given to us in Christ, free. Where we're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Where, to give you a, a nice theological word if, if, if I can, where the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to you when you come to him in faith seeking salvation by Christ and Christ alone. Turn back with me. If you're in Romans, please do. Come back with me. I want to show you just one place where this is so obvious in Romans chapter 3. Hey, are you awake out there? You there? Give me an uh uh-huh. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. You look like I was boring you. And I could do a soft shoe up here a little bit if you needed me to. Romans chapter 3, I want you to see how Paul is thinking in terms of righteousness in his writings here. Look at verse number 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. There it is. Now I want to write to you about the righteousness of God. Not your righteousness that you think you have when it comes to obeying the law. This is apart from the law. There is a righteousness of God that's been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. They knew about it back in those days, he says. The righteousness of God, watch, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now this is the gospel, my friends, because you have to be perfectly righteous in order for you to be reconciled and made right with God and to have eternal life. You have to be perfect for that to happen. Anyone get there yet? Anyone think they have any hope in the world of getting there yet? You know, God knew that, so what did he do? He sent his one and only son, and he imputed, listen, he gave him our sins while on the cross. And he paid for our sins on the cross that whoever would come to him by faith and receive Jesus, John 1 uses the word receive, whoever would receive him would not only have their sins forgiven, but he would impute and declare by giving you the righteousness of his son. You all of a sudden aren't made perfect, but he gives you the perfection of his son like a robe around you so that when he sees you, he sees the innocence, purity, and righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. See, that's the best news you'll hear all day, by the way. That's the gospel. That's where we stand. That's the goodness of the grace and mercy of our God to us. And what Paul is teaching is the kingdom of God is not about debating about vegetables It is about people, human beings on earth who have come to Jesus Christ by faith and had the the righteousness of God imputed to them. The verse was on the screen earlier from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. What Paul is saying is debating about Cabernet? Are you kidding me? The the, the kingdom's all about people who have been justified by faith and have been made righteous by the righteousness of the king. And therefore, what's he say next? There is peace. You still in Romans 3? Turn the page and go to Romans chapter 5. Because Paul's not talking about subjective peace here. That is that feeling of tranquility and serenity in us. Oh, he wants that. He gives that. That's important to his people, but that's not what he means by peace here. 
He means when you're forgiven and given the righteousness of Jesus. Look, verse 1, Romans 5, 1. Since, therefore, we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. I'm not an enemy of the Lord. He doesn't dislike me. He doesn't hate me. He doesn't have it out for me. I've been completely reconciled to him, and there is peace between him and me. And Paul is saying, the kingdom of God, what? You are debating whether or not Tuesday's a special day? The kingdom of God is made up of human beings, creatures of God who he saves and gives righteousness to, declares them righteous, declares them innocent, and makes them right with him and gives them peace. And then lastly, he says, and they live in the joy of the Holy Spirit, not worldly joy, But when all of this becomes true of them, they're infused, no matter what circumstances are going on, they're infused with the joy of the Holy Spirit. These non-essential things that they're bickering about, and so many are bickering about today, masks and science behind viruses and political parties and political stances and what you believe about this and believe about that. What Paul says is those are non-issues in the kingdom of God. They are not for the people of God. you got to understand that when you're under the rule and dominion of God, you are with other citizens of the kingdom who have been declared righteous and innocent, at peace with God, filled with the, the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and here's how I would put it, and then I'm going to show you where I get it. You're new. When you're brought into the kingdom of God, you're made new. You're a new person. And arguments and debates and jumping in the fray over all of those things is not coming from a new heart. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote about divisions to the Corinthians, and in 1 Corinthians 3, you know what he said? I would love to write to you guys as spiritual, but I can't. You're carnal. Why? Because there's arguments and division among you. That, that's carnal. That's of the flesh. It's not coming from the newness that is us in Christ. Now, where'd I get that? Well, remember the discussion that, that Christ had with Nicodemus in John 3? Who remembers that? Give me a yep. <clears throat> Four of you, really? Come on, John 3. It's a really popular passage of Scripture where Jesus has a discussion with Nicodemus and Nicodemus comes out to him one night and he, and he says to him, Jesus, we, we're pretty sure you're from God because we've never seen anything like this and we just don't think anybody could do what you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus just, whew, just turns him and says, we don't need to talk about that. Let me tell you what we need to talk about. Whew. Hey, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you will, listen, never enter the kingdom of God. And I love the way the New Living Bible puts this when Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You, You cannot enter the realm, authority, and domain of God's people where God is king unless you're born again. Let me put it this way, and I don't like putting it this way. I just don't like this phrase. I guarantee you I'll lay down for a nap this afternoon and think, I shouldn't have said that. Why did I say that that way? But let me say it that way anyway. Listen, the only ticket you can have that gets you in the family of God is to be born again. That's it. It's the only thing that gains you entrance into the kingdom of God is being born again, Jesus says. Eh, Nicodemus is all confused. He says, what do you mean? How can an old man like me go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Humans can only reproduce human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. You know what he's saying? You have to automatically be born once to get in the kingdom of God. That's important. Got to be alive here on earth. Got to be a human being. But then you have to go through another birth. You have to start life all over again. You have to be new. Here's where I get this word new. Jesus uses this analogy of being born again. And what do we call a human being when he or she first emerges from mama and they wrap that baby? We say there is a newborn. New. New. 
God prophesied this through Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36. Listen to this. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Galatians 6. Neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but a new life. Romans 6, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, listen, we might also walk in newness of life. That word walk just means live your days. <clears throat> and what he's saying is Jesus was resurrected from the dead just so you could live in newness of life. Romans 7, we're released from the law having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. Ephesians 4, put on the new self. Colossians 3, put on the new self. See where I'm getting it? Not a stretch. Not making it up. Not applying words to it that doesn't, doesn't fit. What, what we're learning is that Paul is saying this. You're arguing over food, meat, masks, disease, what the state should do, not do, politics, this, 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 this. You're arguing and fussing all of over those things. No, 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 no. The kingdom of God is new life. You're new. That's the way they live out there in the world. Now, if you don't believe that, just go home and flip on one of your 24-hour news channels and see if they don't argue, fuss, and quarrel, and judge each other. This is why Jesus said to Pilate, didn't he? My kingdom is not of this world. You can watch that this afternoon and think to yourself, this is not the kingdom of God. Quarreling over food and drink does not proceed from a new heart and a new mind that has a new spirit. It's carnal. And it's fleshly. So then the question kind of gets down to this. And maybe I'm the only one that's bugged by this. And let me be really quick to say I'm bugged about it too because of me. I'm, I'm one of these people so often. I, I'm fighting it. I try to be better. I think I'm better than I was last year. I hope I am. But, but what bugs me about me and what bugs me when I see this going on in the church, these, these arguments and debates and people posting things on social media that just gets in the fray and just in, in, makes it incendiary and just wants to get in and do that. When I see all that, I think, why are we doing that? Why? Where does that come from? That's not new life. That's not gospel. Where does this come from? And I started thinking, you know, we have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, to the creation of man, to start getting an understanding of where this comes from. And remember, when God created, when he created Grandpa Adam and Grandma Eve, remember? We're told that he created them in his image and likeness, right? Now, listen to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, after creating them, this is what God said to Adam and Eve. Listen now. God blessed them and he said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and, listen to this word, subdue it. And have dominion over it. And you say, wait a minute. That's the kind of verbiage you were using describing God. If by the finger of God, the power of God, the dominion of God, the reign, the rule of God... Now we see man created in the image of God and created in the image of God. We are designed by God to have a dominion and have a reign and have a rule over the created order, God says in Genesis 1. <clears throat> it's, that's part of his image. It's just in us. I want to rule. I want to have a domain. I want to be in charge. I want to be boss. I want to be right. It's just in us. It's God made us in us. So God created them perfectly to, to exercise a perfect dominion, a perfect subduing, by the way, which means to control. We'll get the hold on. A perfect, sinless controlling and subduing and dominion and reigning and ruling over the created order. But what happened? 
Grandpa and Grandma, ah, oh, turkeys. I would have too. I'm not going to be too hard on them. Those turkeys, they ate. And what happened? Did we fall out of the image of God? No. We retain the way God made us. We retain the image of God, but now it's all messed up. Now it's, I don't want to use these words, it's deformed. It's all tangled. It's whacked out. So I'm in his image still to rule and have domain, but now it is a sick, sinful rule and domain that I want more than anything else. Listen to what, remember after they ate the fruit and God pronounced some uh, judgments and curses on them, here's what he said to the woman in Genesis 3. After sin had entered their lives, listen to what he says. I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. And that's true, by the way. I've seen it twice. <laughs> now listen to this. Now let me t- and this is how I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. Now let me tell you something about you and your hubby Adam, Eve. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. You know what that means? Subdue. He's going to try to control you, woman. He's going to try to bring you into his domain. Because he just wants a domain. We all want a domain. Somebody moves into your house, what do you say to them? Well, as long as you're in my house, you're doing this. As long as you're living under my roof, this is a rule. Why? It's my domain. It's my rule. And what happened because of the fall, what happened because of sin entering our life, all of a sudden, this right and natural according to our creation, desire and call to have a a rule and domain and to oversee is now marred with sin and we just don't do it right. You want to know something interesting? God's not given up on that because when we're in the new heaven and the new earth, guess what he promises us? That we get to reign with him. He's saying, I'm not done with you reigning and you having a domain, guys. Listen to 2 Timothy 2. If we died with him, we also will live with him. And if we endure, we'll also reign with him. And he promises in Revelation 3, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. What's he doing on his throne? He's reigning. And what's he saying? One day Tony's going to somehow fit on this throne with me (laughs) and reign with me. And near the end of the book in Revelation 22, it says, and they will all see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more and they will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. So created perfectly and without sin to reign and have dominion and subdue. And the day is coming where we will perfectly with Christ join him in his reign, in his domain and kingdom and subdue. But there's this period we're in now where all of a sudden we're trying I'm I'm not going to give up until you just see things my way about those vegetables. you got to see it my way. I'm right. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm getting in the middle of this. What do you mean you believe that about masks or whatever? Come on, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to email you some studies. Get on it with me. What am I doing? What am I doing? Well, you might not be aware of it, but what you're doing is saying, Come into my rule. Come into my space. Come into my domain. Agree with me. Right? Last week I walked into a shop after church, a little shop. I always put a mask on. I I just kind of want to love. I don't want to whatever. For me, it's a testimony. I do it. I forgot it. And I walked in this little shop, and there was one guy standing in there getting some stuff too. And I walked by him, and I heard... Hey, young man, where's your mask? First, I love when I'm called young man, but I thought to myself, oh, no. I, I just preached this literally 20 minutes ago. And I turned around, and this old-timer had a hat that said Korean veteran, and he didn't have a mask on. And I said, same place yours is, bud. 
And he said, right on. They're evil. It's not right. I'm starting a class action lawsuit. You in? <laughs> and I said, I'm in. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'll take money for that for sure. I'm in. <laughs> Why don't I think you're telling me the truth? Well, I don't feel that strongly about it. And I helped him out to his car with his stuff and put it in because he couldn't carry everything. And, and I tapped him on the back and said, I want to thank you for serving. You're a Korean vet, aren't you? And he said, yeah. I said, go get a mask. And he just laughed and got in his car. <laughs> it's just everywhere. And I'm supposed to be new. It's not supposed to be me. I'm not supposed to enter that. Well, I'm done. <laughs> and I was thinking, what am I going to do here? What do we do? I, I spent three weeks on this because it's in my heart for me. It's in my heart for us. It's in my heart for the world. I want us to be so one and so unified that in the middle of all this chaos and division, the world would look at Grace Community Bible Church and say, holy smokes, there's something about them guys. I want that so bad for us. So what do we do? Well, I thought, you know what? Jesus answers that question for us in this little phrase that we all know so well. As a matter of fact, maybe not so much anymore, but if you've been in the church for any amount of time, we used to sing it all the time. And I wonder if we knew what we were singing. I wonder if we even understand it now. Remember we used to sing... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteous. What, you, what, what were we singing? What's that mean? Seek the kingdom of God first. First. Make of first importance the kingdom of God Every minute of every day of your life, what's that mean? Well, I think it's a huge question with a multifaceted answer, but I, I'll leave you with this. It at least means don't argue about non-essentials because you're new. It at least means this, to be like your king who emptied himself and made himself nothing and took on the form of a man and became a servant and served us, did not think being one with God or being God himself was something he had to tenaciously hold on to and say, not doing it, this is my domain, this is my reign, not letting go of it, but rather laid down his rights and dignity and place on the throne to come and serve and die. There's so much to making the kingdom of God a first priority in your life, but it at least means being like the king of our kingdom. Father, I ask that in Jesus' name, you'd accept our repentance and grant us the grace of repentance when we've not sought your kingdom first, when we've lived more carnal than new, when we've gotten in the middle of it. Lord, we, we want to be gospel-oriented people. So I pray in Jesus' name for the filling of the Holy Spirit and reminders, oh, lots of reminders as we go through our week of your grace and mercy in making us new and living out that newness with each other and a world around us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Shalom, church.